Okay, uh, so sir and ma'am, we are ready to go. Uh, just please uh, allow us uh, to take a minute to check whether the streaming is uh, going on properly or not. Then we'll start. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, uh, Shorabi, we are ready to go. You can start. I'm right, ma'am. Hello, everyone. I am Saurabhi Dutta Roy, currently an undergraduate student of English under the University of Calcutta, and I warmly welcome you all to the ISPEL West Bengal Forum this evening. Under the aegis of ISPEL India, our forum was inaugurated on 12th November 2021. Since then, we have been resolute in our endeavor to organize programs on a regular basis. Facilitate to Elevate is the motto of the ISPELS, and true to its motto, ISPELS' continual efforts lie in creating a collaborative learning ecosystem, uh, cultivating a love for the English language and literature to develop lifelong learners, and promoting healthier education comprehensively. After implementing a few changes, here we are with a fresh new perspective of ISPELS West Bengal Forum. We would like to thank Dr. Anupama Bhora, President ISPEL India, and Professor G. A. Khanasham, Founder and General Secretary of ISPEL India, for the indispensable contribution towards the unrelenting success of the forum. Uh, without any further ado, I would now like to quickly introduce the Master of Ceremony for today's session. Uh, Ms. Mohona Chatterjee is an assistant professor at the Amity Institute of English Studies and Research, Amity University, Kolkata, West Bengal. She is currently pursuing her PhD from the Department of English, West Bengal State University, Barashat. She has her research interests in partition literature and refugee studies. She has also published several research articles in refugees international and national journals. Uh, I now request you, ma'am, to kindly take it over from here. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. I hope I'm audible. Uh, yes, ma'am, you are. Yes, but ma'am, there is an echo. We have two devices working at the same time. <laughs> echo in your. Uh, no, I really don't have two devices working. Okay, now it's fine. Now it's fine. Please tell okay. me. Okay, fine now. Yes. Okay. Uh, Sorry for that technical glitch. Uh, uh, good evening to the uh, Honorable Chairperson and the Speaker. I would uh, like to introduce uh, and would ask a couple of minutes from the audience to give me a few minutes time to introduce the Chairperson and the Speaker. Uh, so our Chairperson today is Dr. Indrani Dave, who is the Principal of Nistadini College, Purudia, West Bengal and has a teaching experience of more than 34 years. She is the author of five books, four academic books, and the fifth being a collection of short stories. The later publication was Living with Monsters, a study of the characterization in Aldous Huxley's novel by Rucklitch. She also has 36 articles published in various books and journals. She is a well-known speaker at various national and international seminars and conferences. She is also an international collaborator in the World Shakespeare Project, Emory University USA, and the official Purulia representative of the Robert Medhur Hampshire College USA, and Elizabeth Mead Trust for awarding scholarship to two students every year. Among her research-oriented work, she was the supervisor for a BPL survey in Purulia, conducted jointly by West Bengal Rural De Development Department and Vidya Sagar University in 2007. She also participated and was acknowledged in a documentary on show dance directed by Elizabeth Gilstrom, Kalmanzo College, USA in 2011. She has, to her credit, a UGC minor research project on English language teaching in the rural schools of Purulia district, completed in 2016. 
She is the recipient of five awards, among which is the prestigious Shiksha Ratna Award from the West Bengal Government in 2019, the Best Principal Award from the University of Burdwan in 2010, and a prize for translation from the Saitya Academy, New Delhi in 2008. We humbly uh, welcome uh, Professor uh, Indrani Dev to uh, kindly uh, be the chairperson of today's session. Thank you, ma'am, for being here. Yes, uh, thank you, and I now would take the privilege to introduce mm -hmm. our honorable speaker, Professor Omrit Shen, uh, who is presently professor and former head, Department of English mm -hmm. at Vishwabharati Shantiniketan. And Professor Shen, as we all know, is interested in 18th century studies, travel writing, Tagore studies, and the history of sciences. He has won the Outstanding Research Award for his doctoral dissertation, the narcissistic mode metafiction as a strategy in Wall Flanders, Tom Jones and Tristram Shandy, published in 2007. Some of his major publications and edited volumes include Gitanjali, the Centenary Edition, Rabindranath Tagore, The Unsung Hero, Rabindranath Tagore and His Circle, Sharing the Dream, The Remarkable Women of Shantaniketan, The Scottish Enlightenment and the Bengal Renaissance, the Continuum of Ideas, and Shantani Ketan for Visitors. He was a joint coordinator of the EGCU Kerry project on the Scotland-India Continuum, Tagore and his Circle, and the deputy coordinator of the UGC SAP project on Rabindranath Tagore, the East-West Confluence at the Department of English. Among his major awards, he has won the Outstanding Thesis Award by the Government of India, the Research Award by the UGC, the Oxford 18th Century Bursary, and the host of academic recognitions. He has traveled ex extensively as project coordinator for the UKRI Award to Edinburgh, Scotland, as invited speaker to the University of Oxford and Twickenham, Tongzi University, Shanghai, China, Egypt, and Spain, and has also delivered the Tagore Memorial Lecture at the Rabindranath Tagore Center under the Mahatma Gandhi Institute at Mauritius. Professor Amrit Sen is also presently officiating as the director of Granthana Vivaga at the publication wing of Vishwa Bharati since July 2018. I humbly welcome Professor Sen to be the speaker and as we all know today, our very awaited topic is the unfor is the those unforgivable unforgivable curses in Harry Potter. Over to you, sir. Uh, sh should I begin or uh, right? Yes, sir. Kindly, thank you. Please begin. Okay. Very good. Uh, magical evening to everybody, but uh, I would just like to begin this on a slightly somber note. Although you know, Harry Potter is about passing away and reconciliation, but the first person who actually handed me a Harry Potter novel way back in 1998 was my colleague at Shantini Ketan, Chamantok Dash. Shomantok and I shared a lot of interests, one of them being avid readers of children's literature. And it was in this context that Shomantok had handed me this book and said, you read this, it's something you like. Later on, I remember each of us used to buy one of these volumes and lend it to each other. So wherever Shomantok is watching from or listening in, Here's to that shared foundation. Now, the question that I'll be asking today is 25 years from its first publication. You remember the date, of course, June 1997, that uh, <clears throat> The Philosopher's Stone is published. Why has Harry Potter been so... so accepted and so famous as a text and a cultural product. Now, all of that, that is an encyclopedic subject. But 
what has it meant actually for children and also for adults like us who have bought into the adult uh, i'm sorry into the harry potter franchise because after all harry potter is not just a literary character anymore it is it is much more it is an almost an ecosystem literary ecosystem of its own so these are some of the questions that i'm going to ask and i'm also going to raise something which is which is critical in nature as to whether the harry potter franchise is actually emblematic of the age we live in and i'm going to construct a slight timeline for harry potter in many ways later on in this talk now uh, if you remember that the first harry potter was published in hardbound in 500 copies 5150 copies in paperback seems magical isn't it uh, jk rowling was paid 2500 pounds for it now uh, this of course later on proliferated so that we have seven novels one spin-off play eight films and dozens of video games on harry potter that's why i use the word franchise uh jk rowling incidentally was the first billionaire uh first author as a billionaire and uh, as this they count harry potter has been translated into 78 languages i might have missed one or two uh, uh figures yet as a novel which is a children's literature we've counted 158 deaths in harry potter so it's incredibly complex as a text in many ways uh, now let me come to this question about children and harry potter and my gateway of entry or the point of entry into this entire debate about harry potter is those three or are those three unforgivable curses which if you spell out you automatically earn a one way ticket to askaban what are these three curses and i sorry i repeat this but all of you know uh, the first and this is graded is imperium which fundamentally translated from latin means i command then comes crucial i torture and the third of course which Jake Rowling suggested that she borrowed from abracadabra interesting history that that word has was uttered to kill a disease and uh this fundamentally is the avada kedavara once again uh, referring to the kedavar uh, the word kedavar in latin as well so the death curse so control torture and kill three gradations of the same theme of control one at a basic level two at a far more vicious level and the third is at an absolute level so in many ways the harry potter novels have been seen as allegories of control and there have been many sources which have been attributed to it the obvious one being the third reich but equally the salem which charles the spanish inquisition all of these have been seen as somewhere backgrounds through which the novels have progressed equally of course the repository of western myths that uh, jk rowling has fallen back upon so far i have nothing really new to offer now where i would like to come in is in this incredibly violent world of harry potter how have children been drawn in so my first question is if 
At the end of, at, in book four, when mad-eyed Moody, who turns out to be Barty Crouch Jr., is teaching these unforgivable curses as part of a pedagogy. And the Harry Potter books talk about death continuously. But remember, these are not ordinary deaths. These are violent deaths. Why have children taken so incredibly to this? Now, of course, those of you who teach Harry Potter will remember Freud talking about the particular age that uh, <clears throat> Harry Potter starts off with 11 years uh, till the first, till the fifth book where he reaches adolescence as the latency period. Now, the latency period is a very interesting period which is characterized by quite a number of features. And I'm borrowing on some work that's been done by William A. Corsero who talks about this in, from the books, The Sociology of Childhood. He talks about uh, this particular period as being marked by, and these are phrases which I'm borrowing, intentionality, the wish to have an impact, control over circumstances, so the blatant fantasies of childhood are now gone. There's a certain degree of intentionality. There's a wish to have an impact, control over circumstances, formation of self-identity and independence, and a certain propensity for risk taking. You can immediately relate all of these to Harry Potter. Now, also important, as Freud will talk about, is the concept of fantasy, of this, you know, fantasy of the latency period. The one sees, the child sees himself as special, standing up to authority, and very importantly, also, this is the age which Freud suggests marks a certain amount of connectedness. So no longer is it important to think about only oneself as special, but also relate to the circumstances, build friendships, enduring friendships, and standing by one's uh, companions. This is also the age where, you know, the child will have compassion and therefore, you know, a lot of uh, association with uh, the weaker segments of the population. So this is the latency period which J.K. Rowling actually taps into. And much of the psychology of the reader, of the child reader of Harry Potter, draws upon this phenomenon of, uh, of the novel. And therefore, very importantly, one places Harry in this kind of a dichotomy, in this kind of a paradox. He's the boy who lived yet who has lost his all. The boy who lived lost his all. And therefore, Hogwarts as a space for him becomes a kind of a refuge where his entire personality seeks, you know, efflorescence, as it were, watched over. And this is another thing that Freud suggests, that within the latency period, you look up to a mentor, you know, and this, his role is played by Albus Dumbledore to a larger extent, and a few other teachers to a lesser extent. Friendships, Ron Hermione, also with Harry, we remember the other child who was supposed to be special, Neville Longbottom, his associations with the marginalized characters like Dobby the Elf, and so on and so forth. So, in a certain sense, J.K. Rowling is tapping into these, uh, let us say, these repositories of the latency period that the child finds fascinating. This is my first point. Therefore, bringing the child in towards important questions of friendship, 
important questions of the quest of the kind of romance you know fighting against the anti-hero establishing oneself as the hero linking with people within a magical world so there's a certain degree of displacement but remember that this displacement is never to a very great extent so we'll have to remember that you know jk rowling's usage of the latency period fiction is not very extensive it is somewhere also tethered to the modern reality in a very big way i'll come to that a little later on right therefore what are the themes that you look forward to heroism friendship compassion these are major themes which are brought over from the latency period but take a look at the anti hero again here right you know who voldemort almost exact circumstances replicating harry potter uh, residing in a space where he's hated coming to hogwarts at the same age with the same kind of predicament as harry potter marked as the inheritor of the slytherin house and in many ways the doppelganger of harry now here comes the most important element that jk rowling breathes into the harry potter text is the matter of ethical choice now have you found this very interesting that rowling never actually refers to religion the only time where he where she refers to the bible very directly is at the very end of the novel the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death which is taken from corinthians it's interesting what what rolling is doing rather is putting this question of ethics into a very secular magical universe and leading to this question of self identity within that secular self contained magical universe right and therefore dumbledore will almost always remind harry that it is our choices which make what we are even at the end of the novel right harry is given this choice he could move on or he could stay back and finish the job you remember this kind of vision that he has so the most important element that the that the latency period and later the adolescent is given is this question of choice which both you know voldemort exercises as well as is exercised by harry the other thing very important thing that this this also does is the form which harry potter or or rolling uses in harry potter now i'm sure many of you now that this is a this is a let us say canonical novel part of the syllabus many of you teach is the question of genre of this novel is this a romance is this a fantasy what exactly do we fall back upon here and one of the genres which jk rowling uses is the bildungs roman right the formation of identity and you see this is where i i will bring in the unforgivable curse and this is where at this point we need to examine the major characters one by one what are the choices that are made and what is this concept of good and evil that jk rowling is presenting before us now you see if you take a look at the timeline of of harry potter and i've got my diary open here where i have an elaborate timeline here i see that hogwarts is 10th century ad where you know 
segregation and secrecy is made. 11th century, Slytherin makes a very important choice, leaves over the issue of pure blood, right? Hogwarts is rather based on this question of inclusivity. 13th century is where the Deathly Hallows, which I will again come back to, created. Dumbledore meets Grindelwald in 1899. 1905 to 45 is the rise and fall of Grindelwald. Again, very important. The first magical battle reminding us of, again, the past, the pre pre modern period, as it were, you know, flagging together the Inquisition and the Salem witch trials together. 1938 to 70 is the Voldemort period. 1981 is when Voldemort's fall happens. 1980 is Harry Potter's birth. 1981, Lily and James killed. 1981 to 91 is the Darsley period. 1991, technically, is year one of Harry Potter, year one in school, and the book is published in 1997. So 91, 97. 1992, 93 is the Chamber of Secrets, second book published 1998. 1999, third book, the Marauders return very importantly. 2000 is when Voldemort returns, the period being 1994 to 95, and so on and so forth. Right. Now, if I take a look at what happens to the world at large at this during this period, you know, 1991 is also the period of the ending of the Gulf War, which makes you know, war a kind of a video game. I think this is very important because this entire, you know, creation of Harry Potter as Ace Byatt will later on talk about is uh, making the threat distant. I'll come to this later on, but please remember this. 1989 would have been when the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, 2000 is when George Bush is elected. And 2001 is when the Al-Qaeda is in its uh, full force. Uh, Sale uh, Rowling referred herself to the Salem witch trials and talked about herself being the mongrel product of this European continent and an internationalist. My values are not contained by or prescribed by borders. Right. I'm sorry, I've meandered a little bit. But I wanted to get these facts and dates and the background together so that we know how Rowling or where Rowling was coming from when she created this world. And I was, let me get back to this concept of the Bildungsroman, the matter of choice, ethics in Harry Potter. Now, you see, all the three curtains are used by Voldemort and, of course, his cohorts willingly, right? If a Bellatrix Lestrange tortures Neville's parents to an extent with the other death eaters that they are, you know, institutionalized. Crucio is a curse that is used when Voldemort comes to power later on also, right? Therefore, it's a choice that Voldemort is making clearly. He is on the worst side of ethics. He is the anti-hero for whom torture, segregation, creating the mudbloods as separate, torturing and killing anybody who does not subscribe to his views is permissible. Right. So this is the extreme side of ethics or non-ethics if you want it to be. So the, the kind of uh, the the unforgivable curses are forgivable for uh, Voldemort. Not only forgivable, they are preferable. Right. So that's one system. That's a negative, on the basis of which we will now measure what the other characters 
Achilles. Now, the, among the other characters, of course, you keep Harry. Harry is apparently on the other side, on the other extreme. But is he? If you remember that Harry too uses the imperious curse, right? Over the goblin, for example, right? And even later on, he will try and use, he uses the Cruciatus curse on Amicus Caro, and he will try and hit Bellatrix with the Cruciatus curse as well, right? Uh, Bellatrix is surprised, but it is only mildly uh, sort of affected. And she makes a very important point there that one must intend to harm. So within Harry, who stands as it were for the common child, there is this rage, there is this anger, there is this desire to retaliate. But on the ethical side, this desire to retaliate is never marked by any real intentionality. And that is what makes Harry Potter so different. Remember that he is the recipient of the Avada Kedavara curse and he survives, but he never uses it. In fact, his signature curse is something else altogether, which is rather benign. Right. So, these are the two, but that does not mean that rage, anger, hatred is not permissible in the world of Harry Potter. Now, the two characters who stand in between with these unforgivable curses, of course, are Dumbledore and Sneak. You will remember that Dumbledore is crafted, in, in fact, from the, from the fifth book onwards, certain heroes fall. And the first one of them is Harry Potter's father where he recognizes that James was a school bully, but who stood for the good. So, you see, another very important point that J.K. Rowling makes is this gradual transformation of character and also recognition that once heroes of the latency period might not be the hero of the adolescent period. So the Bildungsroman happens at a, at a much sophisticated level within Harry's psychology, as it were. He's trying to wake up to the realities of his heroes and his mentors. Dumbledore becomes a very, very crucial problem. You see, Dumbledore does not use the imperious curse to that extent. But Dumbledore is really manipulating almost everybody in this text. Of course, he knows what Harry's fate is. And therefore, you know, it's a very important point that Snape makes. Are you, so you've reared him so that you can send like a sheep to the slaughter. Right. Secondly, in this entire friendship with Grindel, Dumbledore is seen as an extremely compromised individual. However, this compromised individual later on transforms himself. Right. And the third point where we, of course, recognize what Dumbledore has done is the death of Ariana. And therefore, there's this entire fury of Dumbledore's younger brother against him. Right. And the entire last book, in many ways, is also about, I mean, remember that the, that the penultimate book has lionized Dumbledore. The last book will slowly strip away a part of this benign generosity from Dumbledore, part by part, so that the Bildung's Roman remains complete in the sense that while Harry remains 
the Dumbledore loyalist. The character of Dumbledore has been compromised to a large extent. One of the things that I'm reminded of when I read Harry Potter is, of course, this concept of innocence and experience. And it is the experience of the adolescent continually encroaching into the innocence of the latency period. Now let's come to the, the character who, in many ways, is the most enigmatic character of Harry Potter, and that is Snape. Now you remember that Snape is the one who actually uses the killing curse on Dumbledore. And it, it is not very flattering for Dumbledore because Dumbledore has manipulated Snape's sense of guilt so that Snape will ultimately hurl the killing curse at him. Right? Therefore, it's interesting in the sense that Dumbledore never fires the killing curse, but forces Snape to fire the killing curse onto him. And Snape has the most difficult choices. So the first is a wrong choice that he makes. And he tries to gradually redeem himself, all the while seething with a sense of anger, envy against Harry Potter. So there's a James in Harry Potter, there's a Lily in Harry Potter. And Snape is, as it were, continuously in conflict with these two personalities of Harry Potter when he responds to that. Right. You, you will have to remember this, therefore, that Snape is himself also creating curses like Sectum Sempra, which again are very dangerously close to the unforgivable curses. Is Snape somewhere really into the dark box? You know, is there a propensity of great evil within Snape? Redeemed by this sense of love? So ultimately, you see, the Redeemer in Harry Potter, ultimately the Redeemer in Harry Potter is love. At the end of it, this is in many ways a book which valorizes love over heroism, over power, and any other value system. So it's this mix, I think, that uh, that J.K. Rowling kinds of brings in this, these questions that she frames when she uh, asks uh, children to evaluate and fax their Bildung's Roman, this coming-of-age novel, forcing oneself to acknowledge one's choices and alerting oneself to the value of love and friendship is the only thing is or rather is the primary thing that uh, endures endears rather sorry harry potter to the child and that is where the buildings roman leaves him too therefore when harry is ultimately you know in the at the end of the novel when harry has handled these three you know uh, the, the deadly hallows together, the three hallows, as it were, he has, one, learned to renounce power, breaks off the elder one because he recognizes the tremendous harm that absolute power can do. That's point number one. Secondly, he has also come to terms with the resurrection stone, accepted death, mourning and moving on from death, reconciliation. And finally, you know, it's in many ways that this invisibility cloak in Harry Potter, and you remember that final scene, which gives me goosebumps always, you know, uh, Harry being led towards this dark forest where Voldemort is waiting for him, you know, shrouded by his 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 parents and Sirius and Lupin and Ulch, invisibly by the figure of Snape. Right, so this invisibility cloak 
is one which is that of, as it were, love and friendship. Now, one small point that I, I need to make also is, let not this be seen as just a novel which in the, in indulges morality. The important thing also is Harry Potter and his parents, the, morar the marauders, Throughout the novel, there is this impish desire to challenge authority, to do which is prohibited, to travel into the forbidden forest, to ride a car which flies through the air, and so on and so forth. So entertainment is there at full value. The child's desire to transgress is also there. But in a, what I'm trying to talk about is the larger moral fabric, which is very surreptitiously woven into the text. Not really very surreptitiously, because at times... Uh, Dumbledore comes through, you know, almost at the end of every novel, there is this caveat by Dumbledore who explains, and that is where the moral message of the text is passed on. Uh, I don't have that much time to linger on this, therefore I will now move on to the other question. Why have we, I read Harry Potter when I was, what, 34, 35 years of age, Many of us have fallen in love with Harry Potter at a very at a more mature age. Why have we fallen in love? And I'll refer to a rather critical essay which was written by A.S. Byatt. But Byatt wrote this in 2003. And Byatt talks about, and this is a point which I come back to, Harry Potter as not really being very magical at all. You know, in fact, Byatt notices that a different order of reality is not really created within Harry Potter. It is as if where the magical overs on the margins of reality. You have telephones, you have cars, you have a tabloid newspaper, you have, you know, a ministry of magic with its regulations, and so on and so forth. So it's almost always, you know, hovering on the brink. And therefore, Wyatt says that you know, children and adults alike are drawn to Harry Potter because Harry Potter never really creates a very definite fantastic world. It merely borrows or just extends the modern world into a, into a magical sort of extension as it were. And Wyatt is very critical of uh, J.K. Rowling's, uh, Rowling's literary art and she says that the young, that the adult who looks at Harry Potter is actually trying to regress. He says, and she says that, you know, it's a caricature of the modern world, which exists in a relationship that is symbiotic to it, I'm quoting from her. Uh, there's bureaucratic interference, tabloid journalism, and no place for the numinous. It is a world which is, and she quotes Gatsby, says, only personal. Nobody. And that is where she says that Harry Potter is largely only about a small world of Hogwarts, Harry, his family, and so on and so forth. Nobody is trying to destroy anything beyond Harry Potter, his friends and family. Right. Therefore, the larger metaphysical relevance of Harry Potter is not there. It is very significantly and very palpably, as Bayat suggests, it's a very fictional world which she calls secondary secondary. Why secondary secondary? Because it is a patchwork of different forms which we have already identified with as adults and we have already gone through. The boarding school, and it Blyton, Roald Dahl, Star Worlds, and it is comfortingly recognizable and immediately available to both the child and the adult world of fantasizing. So Wyatt is suggesting that the child, uh, that the adult, is trying to go back to a world which we do not control. Yet which is never really, you know, in many ways, in any literary way, 
creating an alternative, a completely alternative world. So it's a, it's a kind of what he says. What he says, it's important to understand that the Harry Potter franchise would have to be created because it would be this as part of the culture industry, which would be recognizable, which would have a kind of expansion, but not no real depth. In fact, the last line of the essay says that J.K. Rowling really hasn't created any world like this of fairy casements and magic casements and so on and so forth. She contrasts, in fact, the Harry Potter novels to Terry Pratchett and suggests that neither in language nor in literary quality has, uh, you know, J.K. Rowling achieved anything very noteworthy. Now, that's, of course... Uh, is by its opinion. And that leads us to ask, and this is something which we need to honestly ask ourselves. Why did we like Harry Potter? Was it because it was, as Byatt says, only mildly frightening? so recognizable with our world. You know, there's a lot of entertainment, there's a lot of fun, frolic, but at the end of the day, you know, we all knew that the world would have been saved and it's only Harry's world, really. We identified with Harry, of course, but there was no larger metaphysical threat that Paul de Mott possessed, uh, sort of, uh, face to the world. And secondly, you know, did we really know, even as Rowling becomes famous from the third book onwards, that the films were on their way, that the video games would come later on, and that we were buying into a culture of celebrity rather than buying into any very great and deep literary or ethical universe? Now, what is interesting to the child during a latency period and his adolescence would not actually be to the adult. So why did we actually buy into the Harry Potter franchise as it were? 25 years have passed. 25 years when we've had generations of readers coming to Harry Potter, being fascinated by it. Therefore, it has endured to a large extent. But so did the Lord of the Rings. And so did the fiction of Narnia. The question is, if our realities change, we, after, say, 25 more years, will somebody like me sit down to evaluate Harry Potter as texts which are still relevant to their generation or would you know Harry Potter be sort of accused to being a footnote in the broader history of children's fiction the one last comment that I'd make I'd like to make is you know where J.K. Rowling has deliberately tried to extend, you know, the world of Harry Potter into the world of modern uh, or more adult phenomena. For example, deliberately trying to suggest that Dumbledore was gay. And secondly, a debate about the trans world, which immediately led to a lot of her own readers distancing her, her from the world from the world of Harry Potter and therefore should we then recognize JK Rowling's ability to create for the latency period and under adolescent period a fiction of the Bildungs Roma bringing together the old and the new the mythical and the modern or should we also recognize 
Harry Potter as something that is deeply significant as adult literature offering major literary value which will endure through history. It is with this question that I think I have exhausted my quota of 40 minutes that Shorab had set for me. I thank all the members of this group who have afforded me the space to share my ideas with you. All the people who have gone to make this lecture possible. And with that, I rest my magical or not so magical case. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sen, for your interesting and informative lecture. I now ask this session's chairperson, Dr. Indrani Dev, to kindly share her observations. Uh, uh, thank you, Mohana Chatterjee. First of all, I would like to thank ISPEL, the West Bengal Forum, and everybody connected with it for organizing this lecture today, because of which we have had the opportunity of listening to a brilliant assessment of the three unforgivable curses mm -hmm. from Dr. Omrit Shin. Thank you so much for this lecture and he has dealt with so many topics about these verses that we have a lot of food for thought. The imperious curse, the Cruciatus curse and the Avada Kedavra curse, these represent the worst acts that human beings can commit against one another, as shown in Harry Potter. These acts, when used with a criminal purpose or for furthering dictatorship, are imposed on people for furtherance of conformity to a particular imposed discipline. Some kinds of punishment are always used by all governments and states. And I am saying this because he has particularly referred to modern history while talking about these curses. So they have always been used by governments and states as deterrents for breaking the rule of law. But when it is used as a form of coercion, it borders on the extreme imposition of power. Punishments can be judged as fair when they are proportional to the offense. They are unfair and sadistic if they are disproportionate to the offense. The main purpose of such punishments is to exact complete subjection from the victims. Dr. Shen has spoken very aptly and he has actually made me think about it, about Freud's theory of, about the latency period. He has spoken at length about it and also about the adolescent period as discussed by Freud. I would just like to add a small interpretation of my own that these three unfor unforgivable curses can be interpreted according to the theories of subjection chopped out in Foucault's book, Discipline and Punish. Foucault has uh, grouped punishments in four parts, torture, punishment, discipline, 
and prison. Torture exemplified in Harry Potter through the Cruciatus curse is closely linked with execution also, which is exemplified by the Avadakadavra curse. The prison, Azkaban in Harry Potter, the hospital, St. Mungo's, the school, Hogwarts of course, the judiciary, which is the Wizengamot, the Supreme Court of the Wizarding World, they are all parts of the strategies of power which have been mentioned by Foucault. The dense web of power relations is called the microphysics of power. It will be noticed that Voldemort's purpose was to overtake all these strategic points of power, beginning with Azkaban and ending with the school, Hogwarts. The instruments with which he attempts to do this are the unforgivable curses, which are his methods of total subjection. Foucault traces the development of the public's, uh, the development of types of punishment from the public spectacle of torture before the 1800s to the strict regulations in prisons involving an organized police apparatus and an all-encompassing system of surveillance. It must be remembered in Harry Potter that apart from cold-blooded torture with the Cruciatus curse, Voldemort uses the Death Eaters as his frontline army and the main job of those in the Ministry of Magic is surveillance particularly surveillance of those wizards who are muggle-friendly. And this is connected with what Dr. Shin has spoken of regarding the Third Reich and also the Salem trials. According to Foucault, surveillance and observation are everywhere. And these are the primary instruments of exercising power, particularly by Voldemort. Uh, I'm quoting a little bit from Foucault. Is it surprising that prisons resemble factories and that schools, barracks and hospitals all resemble prisons? So, if we use Hogwarts as a microcosm, we find that the school is slowly turned into a kind of prison, beginning from the tenure of Dolores Umbridge, who did not hesitate to use the unforgivable curses on students to make them toe the line. The purpose of Voldemort and the Death Eaters is to control the minds and bodies of both wizards and muggles, to gain complete control over the world. If it is difficult to gain control by terror and surveillance, then he uses the imperious curse. I am again quoting Foucault, do not demand of politics that it restore the rights of the individual as philosophy has defined them. The individual is the product of power. What is needed is to de-individualize the individual. Now, the ultimate means of de-individualizing the individual is the imperious curse. That is how I see it. Another point is that uh, Foucault has mentioned it also, that the wielding of the instruments of power is the same for whoever is at the helm of power. In Harry Potter, the three curses in question are unforgivable because they are the favorite instruments of the wicked. But 
Dr. Shane has pointed out this point again also that are they totally rejected by the good? That is an important question. Sirius Black told Harry once that during the first war against Voldemort, the Aurors were given permission to kill and use the unforgivable curses against suspected death eaters. He has also, I mean, uh, Dr. Shen has also mentioned how Harry has had tried to use the Cruciatus curse. And Harry using the Cruciatus curse is acceptable to the Aurors. However, the point that Benetrix made brings out the difference between the good and the evil. One has to totally really want to cause pain and to mean it for the curse to be effective. One has to enjoy causing pain to kill. But here also Foucault's point is still valid. Because as the question that uh, Dr. Shen has raised is very important. When Snape uses the Avada Kedavra curse, is it good or is it wicked? That is an important question and he has mentioned it. If a death eater uses a curse and unforgivable, uh, after all the curse is called unforgivable by whom? Not by Voldemort. It is called unforgivable by the Aurors, by Dumbledore, by, uh, the, by the people in Hogwarts. So, if a death eater uses such a curse, that will earn him a life sentence in Azkaban. If an aura uses it, it is pardonable. As such, the instrument of power is used by both sides. The difference lies in the intent. The intent does not lie in righteous anger, the anger you, that we see in uh, Harry the type that Bellatrix mocked at. It lies in a poisonous, sadistic, malevolent purpose of causing pain and harm. It must be remembered that Harry, in his, again, that, uh, that point has also been mentioned by Dr. Shin, that in the fight against Voldemort, Harry does not use an unforgivable curse. He kills Voldemort. But how? Because Voldemort's killing curse rebounded on him. Harry didn't use it. That shows the intent, the intention. I agree with Professor Shin that Harry Potter is both a book for children and for adults. I agree with him that Harry Potter has many points to ponder about. It is connected with modern history. It is connected with many features that trouble us in the modern world. It has a lot of violence. I agree with him on all these points. And I thank him for raising all these points in a large sphere. He has covered such a huge sphere in his lecture. The point is that we have a lot to think about, a lot to think about, but one point, I personally think that children's literature can also be long-lived. It can also be, uh, well, uh, immortal even if it is not interpreted from the adult's standpoint. Harry Potter has given us a lot to think about, but I'm glad that children and adults both enjoy it in their own ways. So thank you, 
very much to Professor Sen. Thank you to all the uh, organizers of this webinar. And I will look forward to other webinars like this in the future. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Dave, for your valuable elucidation. Uh, Professor Sen, we don't have any questions. If there is any, let me check the chat box. Uh, we have a question. May I go ahead with the questions, sir? See it also, right, right. Uh, uh, one small point before I answer this question, and thank you, uh, Indranidhi, uh, and I hope you don't mind me calling you Indranidhi. No, no, that's... Uh... Please do call me. Dr. Right. Sen seems horribly presumptuous. Anyways, uh, <coughs> again, it's very interesting in the way that uh, Indrani was drawing in Foucault. And you see, this question of permissibility, one must also remember this. I had noted down somewhere I missed it. You see, is in book four, it's Dumbledore who actually has, you know, asked. Mad Eye Moody, even if he does not know that this is Barty Crouch Jr., to teach the children these curses. Right, absolutely. Absolutely. In teaching students at Hogwarts without Dumbledore knowing is not possible. It's also very interesting in the way in which even institutional pedagogy sort of accepts punishment and teaches this norm of punishment. Uh, to students uh, as a form of, as it were, you know, once again, warning probably also in the sense of, you know, installing a sense of what we will call fear and deterrence. So that's a that's a point I take from you and uh, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting one. Right. Uh, Anupama asks me, uh, Cedric's death in book four appears to be defying poetic justice. What is its impact on children it's a it's a it's a it's a major and uh, uh, it's a very important question really now cedric diggory is of course almost what we will call collateral damage within this war between uh, you know Voldemort and harry or Voldemort and the other side as it were and therefore you know once again like as i keep on pointing out that Harry Potter has a lot of latent issues within the text, which really, uh, which really, in, in, we do not really know what the impact on the on the student, children's mind is. You see, where does this come in? This comes in at the point where where the child is moving on. If you take the fourth book, the child is moving on. This is the point where he's moving on from the latency period to the uh, to adolescence. And this is where, as it were, this fact of death, so far Harry has been lonely, so far death has been something which he has experienced to a large extent, uh, not in its direct potent, with not its direct potent force. Remember, he's struggling with the memory of the parents. But this is where, you see, he faces the death of a competitor as well as a friend. And this is where I think Cedric's death is very important in so moving from this world of innocence to experience, right, and recognizing that we are now entering into a different order of awareness as it were, right? So... For the child, it is not poetic justice at all. But remember, we cannot see this only as one death in a particular novel. We'll have to see this within the broader parameter of the Bildungs Roman that, that J.K. Rowling is trying to create. That would be my response. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sen, for your hey, uh, so we don't have any more questions. Uh, may I ask the audience to kindly unmute themselves and ask questions if they have any? No, sir, we don't have any questions. I uh, thank you for being here today. 
Uh, well, we have another question coming up from Anjana Sho. And the question is, doesn't Rowling make the term which seem normal yes. in Hogwarts world? Where is the same was something warranting death during Salem which trials? True, but you see, uh, interestingly, uh, you know, this is again, uh, <coughs> as I point out, this is something where J.K. Rowling is actually sort of using a figure of fantasy and diluting it to a large extent. As I pointed out, and Bayat also points out, that the the factor of fear and, uh, and uh, we'll say, frightening aspect of of Harry Potter is largely mitigated. We recognize that this is a fictional universe that is created. There's a lot of fun comic involved with it. And the, the witch world is actually, the world of witches and wizards is actually an extension of the human world. So there's nothing of the, the fear of the Salem witch trial remotely encroaching upon this. Although, you know, there are somewhat references to how people have been isolated because uh, they have been called freaks. But more importantly, you see the words which Rowling uses and which have very great relevance here is the words pure blood and mud blood. Right. The two distinguishing words which which sort of segregate uh, the world into two. And this is where the threat of violence blooms. So in a certain sense, although the Salem Witch Trials becomes a source material for uh, for J.K. Rowling. She does not really ever really talk about the the oppression that the witches have had to face. They, they come in a very minor form, right? It's rather this debate on the Third Reich that uh, also in Nanidhi referred to the differentiation between the pure blood and the mud blood. Very importantly, what you can see, Harry Potter, and I'm, I was looking at a few courses where Harry Potter has been used in political science theories, is this question of the refugee that is now encroaching into, into European discursive practices in a very big way. So the refugee is seen as this you know, new blood blood who is encroaching into the white world of the pure blood as it were. And therefore, I would suggest that uh, the concept of the witch is diluted, but this idea of segregation of two kinds of people, discrimination, is something that is much more potent in Harry Potter, even within a narrow circumscribed world of Hogwarts. Uh, can I just uh, add one point so regarding the Salem witch uh, trials? Uh, I just remembered something. When the history of magic was being taught in Hogwarts, it was the, the Salem witch trials were mentioned. And in uh, one class, I remember that uh, the teacher referred to uh, a particular witch, I forget her name uh, in history, who enjoyed who could uh, make a kind of uh, chilling curse, a kind of chilling uh, spell around her. And uh, she enjoyed being burnt so much that whenever they tried to burn her, she put on this chilling, uh, this chilling spell and she faded away. She disappeared. And she liked it so much that she made herself be burned for 36 times. So, she right, it is, it is the same point. It, it, it's mitigated in that sense. The, the memory yeah. of that. Yes, mitigated. yes, yes. It is mitigated. And she is trying to make a big joke out of it, actually. Right. Thank you, Professor Shen. Thank you, Dr. Indrani Dev, uh, for being here today. I uh, now uh, would like to ask the event coordinator, Chorubi Dr. Roy, to kindly take over. Thank you, ma'am. Um, may I now request Dr. Saurav Banerjee, Associate Professor and Founder Member and the Vice President Administrative of ISPL West Bengal Forum to virtually present the certificates. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. And uh, this is the most embarrassing time of my life. 
presenting certificate to uh, Unani Man Man Professor Robinson who happens to be my teacher. So, but uh, I think I still have to do it. Uh, so please, sir, ma'am, don't take it as a kind of a certificate. Take it as a kind of uh, a mark of a black cube. And uh, the certificates are on the screen. The first one was to Dr. Indani Dev for being such a wonderful chairperson and for showing so much of life and adding to what Professor Ambedkar has already said. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. And for uh, agreeing to be present with us in and sharing our time. So, the next week. Yeah. And uh, this one goes to Professor Ambedkar. Thank you, sir. Amrita, thank you for a wonderful uh, deliberation. Uh, when we were students, I, I cannot but help but share this. That when we were students, we knew that Amrita would never take his class for a full hour or so. But whatever he said in those 45 50 minutes would be gems. And we can, I mean, you could always build on them for uh, two, three hours. So, like, uh, they were all, all, all kind of concentrated things. And so it has been today. It's, it's shown as that Harry Potter is not only a fiction that can be enjoyed, but that we can delve deep. I mean, we can delve, delve very deep into it, and we can find so many nuances on that. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your time and uh, deliberation. Next, please. Next is uh, to Mohana Chatterjee for being a wonderful uh, master of ceremony. Thank you, Mohana. You have conducted with us very well. And Thank finally, you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, finally, uh, to uh, Shorabhi Gattarai, Shorabhi congrats on being a wonderful event coordinator, thanks and very smoothly because of you, so this one is for you. Thank you. And how about your certificate? <laughs> so, you don't get any certificate, sir. You uh, don't have a magic certificate to, to bring out from your hat, from under your hat for yourself? <laughs> no. You're right, absolutely. He has been wonderful, Shorabhi Banerjee. Right. Thank you, thank you. And I'm sorry, I'm it's too much for me to call you Professor Sen, Professor Sen. Sorry, sir, but I'm calling you Amrita. So, sir, you can you move on? Right, thank you, sir. I'd also like to invite you to deliver the vote of thanks now. Okay, okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, where should I begin and where should I end? So, I'll start from the, uh, my, my forum because charity begins at home. So, uh, a big thanks to all members of ICL West Bengal Forum. I'm not taking readings. Everyone from the president to the convener, to the, uh, the, uh, the co conveners and the vice presidents, and everyone, everyone contributed. Otherwise, this wouldn't have happened. So, a big thanks to all of you. A big thanks to all the other members of ICL India Forum who have joined today and who have not been able to join today. We have a different program elsewhere also. And of course, uh, thanks, special thanks to Rumpadi, uh, Dr. Rumpadas. Principal of Mohajpala College, she had got me, I mean, she had suggested Indranini's name. Sorry, now I'm calling you Indranini. Uh, she called me. So, no, 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 of course you meant to call me Indranini. It was a wonderful connection made. And uh, obviously, uh, a big thanks to Amrita. I mean, uh, most of you don't know perhaps that Amrita was suffering from uh, COVID. He was COVID positive even a few days ago. So I, I didn't even, I mean, dare call him. I didn't know how he was. I called Moshwini and asked. Or, uh, most of the incident is of the device and to... Uh, like, COVID, you can't get a lot of money. 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 You uh, but, but before I end, I'd also I mean, like to remember uh, Samantha Das. Amrita began with him, and I mean, uh, I, I, I got him for five full years uh, in, in my DOML days at Vishwavarti, and I cannot help thinking of him I mean, every day. I mean, it's too shocking. And, and uh, I mean, just to make these uh, matters a little light, I don't want to end on a, a grieving note, so let me just tell an anecdote and then end on a happy uh, note. So uh, I've gone to Samantabdal's uh, in office. He was then a professor of uh, the comparative department at Jalapur. He was not yet a co vice chancellor. So I was meeting him after a long time. So I went there, I, I told him, and he met me, and I told him, sir, I am whatever I am today because of you. 
and he told me, so all of those blame us, please write out that, what you have to say, it's your fault. So that's when he saw all of that. And I am, I can proudly say that what I am today is because of the wonderful teachers that I had in my uh, graduation and my master's and Amit Bhai, one of them, and perhaps the most influential person in my life. So with that, I thank everyone who joined today, everyone who would be watching this program on Facebook, we have seen it live, so many people could be joined up because of or because of some other time constraints, so they'll be watching that later. It will be on our YouTube channel also. So I, I thank them all and all who will be watching them in the future. So I, I think we end here uh, on a happy note. And we wish to have a uh, new Amidda and Indranidhi back. Indranidhi next time will be a speaker. Uh, I'll be contacting him and will be a speaker next time. And uh, I think please bless us and help us um, make this group a fruitful forum and so that we can carry on with our video. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.